Good morning, and welcome to another day on the road on the uh, famous Mei Hong Son Loop. Heading towards the end of the loop, sort of, kind of, I'll explain in a minute, because today I'm riding from Pai to the town of Changdao, which is a little bit north of Chiang Mai. I originally was intending to go to Chiang Mai, spend a few days there, and then I have to swing back towards uh, Mesot for my next uh, visa extension. But at the last minute, I decided I wanted to go to Changdao, kind of a smaller town. It's in a beautiful mountainous, jungly setting, I understand, and it's next to the second highest mountain in Thailand. And there's, there's a cave there, and there's the usual temple on a hill, and there's some nice restaurants. It looks like a really cool place to hang out, very much my style. So I'm going to go to Changdao, and I think that means I won't be actually staying in Chiang Mai on this trip. Um, when I leave Changdao, I'm going to be riding past Chiang Mai, but I don't have enough time to uh, spend any days there or any nights in Chiang Mai, which I think is okay because I like the smaller towns better uh, that I've been staying in. I love Pai, Mei Hong Son, Mei Sarang, and I think I'm going to love uh, Changdao. Chiang Mai is getting into that big city territory, which is a bit overwhelming for me, to be honest. It's a bit intimidating, too much to see, too much to do. So anyway, I'm going 128 kilometers to Changdao today. It's uh, 6.30 in the morning, and <laughs> I'm leaving from a uh, different guest house. I was staying in the Lilu Hotel, quite a nice place uh, here in, um, in Pai, uh, thanks to a mystery benefactor who, uh, who tells me he enjoys my videos. This place is the Mr. Jan guest house, which I think is quite well known in, in backpacker circles for a lot of reasons. Very much a lower budget kind of place, and I'm in their lowest budget room and I was quoted if I wanted to stay, you know, extend my stay here, it would be 250 baht per night for this room, fan only. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bungalow. It's like one bungalow divided between two rooms. And I can talk right now because there's nobody in the other room. And we share a, a veranda with the other room. But since a day on the road involves waking up in one hotel or guest house, and then sleeping in another, I thought I'd start today's video with just a look at this place. So this is Mr. Jan, guest house. There's my bedroom with the classic pink. This always cracks me up with these low budget guest houses because you never quite know where the sheets and curtains and towels come from. You think maybe they have all these nieces and nephews that outgrow their bedding and their curtains, and then they all get moved into these rooms because, you know, look at the curtains. <laughs> teddy bear curtains, right? And, uh, you know, in your wildest dreams, you wouldn't, if you were outfitting this place for foreign visitors like me, you know, you wouldn't think, oh man, I'll bet you they'll love teddy bear curtains. No, they just happened to find these teddy bear sheets somewhere. They're probably, they were probably sheets originally off of, you know, a children's bed, their niece or their nephew, and then they converted them into curtains. And you get so many familiar touches in these rooms that I've uh, seen for, you know, decades. I always enjoy, you always see this sign, don't put any clothes on the fan. You could break it um, because they always have these fans in here and then backpackers will do their own laundry, you know, over there in the sink, which they're not supposed to do, but they will. And then they'll drape their wet clothes over the fan or their towel or something to dry it faster. But of course, the weight of the wet clothing, you know, snaps the mechanism. So eventually they have to tell people, don't do it. And uh, attached bathroom. And this one has your typical electric um, hot water heater. And that one works fine. But you have to dial the water flow way back to almost nothing in order to give the water enough time to heat up as it goes through. So this is... Uh, this was my home just for one night. I just needed a, a, one more night here in Pai and um, just to relax yesterday, get organized, and then leave early in the morning to head to uh, Changdao. I'm just outside uh, my room now. There it is behind me, room number one. And right across from me is uh, 
room number two. And I know there's nobody in there because you know, the door is locked from the outside. And uh, the two rooms share the same building and they have this balcony in between them. You know, a seating area there, which is quite nice. One pillow, <laughs> table and uh, chairs and uh, fluorescent light up there. Yeah, Mr. Jan is actually quite an interesting guest house because they have a very nice manicured garden here in the back area. You can't really see it because it's, uh, yeah, it's too dark, but there's a beautiful trimmed hedge here, a lot of trees and flowers and a garden setting. And there's uh, some of the larger bungalows up there. And then there's uh, another smaller one over there. And this is my home right here on the right, forms a one building. But they have this quite nice garden area back here, very nicely landscaped. You know, it's got a little bit of kind of a junky quality, but that's kind of unavoidable because it is a condensed area. But when you arrive at Mr. Jan, you arrive at kind of a parking area out front, and that does not look as nice. So when you first show up, you look at the place and you might think, ooh, kind of a dump, doesn't look very appealing. But then you walk to the back and when you get to the back, you know, that's when you get the garden setting. I wish it was lighter, um, but I'll put in a couple of pictures actually, and you can see it from the pictures, what it looks like. And uh, yeah, it's much nicer in the back than it looks in the, uh, in the front. But the real advantage to staying here is how close it is to the walking street. So walking street is right there. It's like one street over. You can just be there in like a minute. And yet, since it's one street away, you don't get any of the noise or any of the, you know, if there happens to be any drunken behavior from people or whatever's going on, you're not really bothered by walking street because you're set back one street and then you're set back in a garden. So it's actually really quiet back here, really nice and private. And this is the front area I was talking about. So, you know, the family lives here and I probably have a bunch of businesses operating out of there. I don't know. And then they have a nice parking area for motorbikes here, which is really nice. A lot of room for parking. And uh, they even serve a light breakfast over here. They have a nice uh, seating area. And they told me they have, uh, you know, bread and bananas and coffee and tea. And I'm not sure what else they serve for breakfast. Fruits, different fruits, I think. But I will be gone before breakfast is ready, I hope. Yeah, sky is just starting to get light. Crazy thing is that we've had a ton of rain lately. Even last night it rained hard. And I was wondering... Um, what, what that was going to mean for today's trip because uh, yeah I don't want to be riding in the rain but uh, I think it's going to be okay I have all of my backpack straps in the seat compartment it's actually gotten quite a bit lighter in just the last few minutes but yeah, you can sort of see you know some of the garden setting that's back here look at that These creatures are very vocal. Oh. I think they were uh, frogs of some kind. And here's the archway, the hedge archway with the uh, antelope uh, wooden carving at the top. Yeah, they even have a, a vegetable garden back here. And there's some of the other uh, bungalows. People seem really nice too. I had a very, very warm, friendly, and informative welcome when I showed up yesterday. So, this room, to be honest, is probably a bit on the rough side for most people. I think uh, you'd, people would probably be happier in one of these, uh, you know, nicer ones up there. You know, the bed in particular has one of those, you know, U shapes. 
<laughs> the middle has sagged over time. So if you happen to be sleeping on your stomach, you end up bent in the U and it, uh, it can be pretty hard on your back. So it's not, not the best um, mattress or room really. A bit rough around the edges, I would say. But uh, I'd be perfectly comfortable in there for a few days. Okay, all set and uh, ready to go. Took longer than I'd like. Um, uh, <laughs> I can't see my watch. I don't know what, uh, what time it is. But uh, yeah, sky is quite light. I thought I would be on the road when it was uh, still dark out. But uh, yeah, it's time to get going. I'm so hot inside all my layers and jacket now. I need the cold wind to cool me down. And they do have the breakfast is all ready. You know, it's there waiting for me and uh, they were encouraging me to stop and have breakfast. But um, I'm always in the mood to just uh, get on the road. Oop. <laughs> Wrong direction. Oh no, I can go that way. It's okay. <laughs> Get. I did that yesterday too. They have that very uh, apparent looking driveway, but there's two ways to get out of here. And uh, this would be the, uh, the way that isn't locked. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good omen for the start of the day or not. But as I've done a million times, I, I blame all of this on the GoPro. Filming my day has made me, you know, a tenth as dumb, or a tenth as smart and uh, ten times dumber than I normally am. And that's one reason why my habit of always taking the time to go back to my room one last time and looking it over is so important because in my present mood and state of mind I could so easily leave something behind uh, like really important things I could probably leave you know my day pack behind and not even realize it and my day pack of course has my entire life in it so yeah, I could see myself hopping on the scooter and just riding away and uh, leaving it behind. I, I would do something that weird these days, so I have to be really careful. The absent-minded uh, professor is what I've become. I'll be riding right by the, the Lee Lu Hotel on my way out of town. right here on my left the purple timeout sign from London you can see they have their breakfast all laid out and ready to go they served a really nice breakfast too once they had more visitors more guests they put on a full buffet and you could help yourself to anything you wanted they had the uh, you know the Thai style rice porridge as well as the Western things like toast and eggs and ham and sausage and coffee and juice, all that stuff. It's really nice. Ah, cold wind. Feels nice this time. Though it's not as cold as it has been. I don't know what's going on. I can feel it. This air is not actually that cold. The mornings that I've left pretty early to go to the Pie Canyon, to the cave, places like that, my hands would just turn into claws because it was so cold so fast but it's actually pretty warm today Chiang Mai is 128 huh I thought uh, Chiang Dao was also 128 I think it is or maybe I got those two numbers mixed up but I think it's about 128 to Chiang Dao as well the first part of this ride is probably the most famous part of the Mei Hong Son loop in terms of the curviness of the road and then you go through all the mountains go through all the curves and then you hit a main highway and at that intersection you can turn right to Chiang Mai or left 
to head north to uh, Changdao. So whether you go to Chiang Mai or to Changdao, oh, so, there's so many coffee shops over here on my left that I never got a chance to visit. I could spend a month in Pai without, uh, without breaking a sweat, just hanging out. A new coffee shop every day, but uh, it was time to go. Just passing coffee in love. <laughs> I was talking to a woman yesterday at the place. I had an, uh, a sunset beer down by the river. And the waitress who brought me by beer, my beer, she was very friendly and very conversational. She spoke some English. So I was chatting with her. And she asked me what I had seen in the Pai area. So I started listing all the attractions. And I started talking about coffee and love. My whole story about coffee and love and how it was famous because it was in the two movies, the Thai movie and the Chinese movie, all that, that long story. And she kind of laughed and said, well, it used to be famous. It's, it's really not a big deal anymore. Uh, there was, when the movies came out, that coffee shop was very popular. But she said, not anymore. It's, a, it's star has a faded. But at the same time, whenever I went to look at all the, uh, the one day or half day tours down at the walking street, a lot of them listed coffee in love as on their itinerary and that's where I got the idea that it was still a famous place because it's actually on all the tours so there you go I'll also be passing the Pie Canyon on my way I was sort of tempted to visit all these places one last time ride up to the big Buddha, stop at Coffee and Love, stop at the canyon, and uh, take in all these sights before I left. And I might have done it if the sun was out, but still very cloudy, very damp. There's not going to be any kind of a sunrise. So I'm just going to ride, and the sun hopefully will come out. during my journey. So I passed the uh, Pai Canyon a, while, a ways back and I'm here at the uh, World War II Memorial Bridge which I already visited and spent a lot of time here. <laughs> Motorbike um, it just seemed like a convenient spot to stop and uh, button up my orange jacket. I left it open for a while for the wind to sort of cool the sweat, and now I'm starting to get chilled. Oh, oh but man, I'm just, I'm not comfortable this morning. I don't know, it's just damp. The air is just like swimming in water. It is so damp. Everything is damp. Okay, all set to, to go. I saw a couple of foreigners on scooters at the Pie Canyon, and I was thinking how unfortunate it was for them that the weather is like this on their day to go to the Pie Canyon. And uh, from that point of view, considering the, how the weather has been for the last few days and how it is today, I can say that I've been very lucky, really, for this trip because up until the last few days, the weather has been perfect. Perfect blue, sunny skies every day, amazing temperatures. And I even managed to, uh, to get to Pi when the weather was still like that. So I had perfect weather for my visit to the Pi Canyon, to the Memorial Bridge, to the Bamboo Bridge. Uh, even when I went to the cave, I mean, the, the weather doesn't really matter when you go to the cave because you're here inside. But um, I'm thinking in particular of the Pi Canyon because I had such a, a glorious sunrise experience when I went there. That was such a good, good experience. And I mean, you'd still enjoy it. You enjoy everything you do regardless of the weather. But <laughs> all things being equal, 
if you're going to a place like the canyon, you wouldn't mind some, uh, you know, a beautiful clear sky as opposed to a cloudy, overcast day like today. So, man, and these dogs, I can never get over that. I talk about it all the time. I've seen a half dozen of them right in the middle of the road, just lying there. On a, and this is a high speed kind of highway. People are moving fast. People talk about how smart dogs are, but they still haven't grasped the idea of traffic. Crazy animals. And I had animals on my mind because while I was at the Pie Canyon, I noticed uh, there's a couple of dogs there that are all, not the Pie Canyon, at the bridge, Memorial Bridge, where I just was. The dogs that were there during my visit were there again today. And uh, they're very, the, I, I recognize them and they clearly live there and they come up to all the visitors to the bridge and they're very friendly and I pet them. The one poor fellow, you see this quite often with dogs, had a big tumor on one of his legs. You know, big dangling tumor in one side of it had broken open and was kind of raw and bloody and you see things like that all the time as you're roaming around uh, kind of Southeast Asia in general and it kind of breaks your heart and you start to, a lot of foreigners end up doing uh, animal rescue operations full time because they'll see a dog like that and they'll decide to stop, get it medical treatment, find it a good home, you know, take care of it. And they find that to be so fulfilling that eventually it becomes their entire life and they settle down in Thailand or Myanmar or Cambodia or Taiwan, anywhere, and they become full-time, uh, you know, animal rescue people. There's quite a few of them all over, all over Asia. And I can understand why that would happen. And I was also thinking about animals because up ahead on this highway, there is a place where you can do a detour down a much smaller road. And on this smaller road is quite a well-known uh, elephant sanctuary. And I was thinking about going there. I did some reading about it. Of course, with elephants in particular, you end up being very careful. You want to go to a place where the elephants are being well taken care of. And as far as I could tell, this place only has elephants that they have rescued from a bad situation. And you don't ride the elephant. The elephants aren't hit. They aren't chained. They don't do any of these things that uh, abuse the animals. So from everything I could read, it would be okay to visit this elephant sanctuary and you bathe the elephants and you feed them. It's a bit of an expensive uh, experience to have, but I've certainly never touched an elephant in my life. I've never fed one. It would be, it would be something quite interesting to do. But at the same time, with elephants, I'm so hesitant. They're just such majestic animals and there's a lot of red flags as soon as you start talking about elephants. And a couple of days ago, I was watching a couple of uh, YouTube videos from travel vloggers uh, who were traveled through Pai and were doing the Mei Hong Song Loop. And I was just curious how other people were experiencing this part of Thailand. And, uh, I came across this one video. I can't remember who it was now, the name of the vlogger, but it was a, a, a couple, uh, two, two foreigners, and uh, on a motorcycle, you know, taking video of their, their trip. And partway through the video, they stopped at, at, a, at a kind of elephant place and they were looking at two elephants. And these elephants were chained, you know, they had chains around their feet, I think they did, the elephants were swaying, you know, swaying strongly from side, like doing that movement that you see. You only, you see that when animals are, are suffering 
kind of a mental breakdown, like really heavy mental stress. You see that in, in terrible zoo conditions where animals develop this physical behavior pattern, you know, where they're swaying from side to side, a repetitive physical movement. And these elephants were clearly in that condition. And yet somehow these foreigners didn't seem to realize it because they were, you know, looking at the elephants, interacting with them. And they joked that these elephants were so happy that they were dancing. And they said on the video, wow, look at these elephants, they're dancing, they're having so much fun. And that kind of surprised me because I thought this idea of this repetitive uh, movement that you see in animals, I thought it was very well known that that's a clear sign that the animals are, are in, in severe mental distress. But these people didn't seem to know that. Anyway, seeing that video and seeing those elephants made me sort of pull back from this idea of visiting the, uh, the elephant sanctuary, even if it does have a very good reputation. Anyway, we'll see. Well, I'm doing all this babbling largely because I don't have big plans for today's trip. I don't have plans to stop and go to very interesting sites along the way. So I'm just going to be riding doing the hundreds and hundreds of curves, enjoying the day, going to Changdao. So I don't know how much of video I'll be taking along the way. I'm riding very slowly, even more, even slow for me because the roads are still very wet from all the rain last night. time to uh, check in and catch up on this trip. 
I'm not in Changdao yet. I'm actually on Highway 7, Highway 107. I've come down out of the mountains. My trip through the mountains, that part of the mountains is over. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, 1095, that highway meets up with 107. Changdao is 34 kilometers to the north. Downtown Chiang Mai is 40 kilometers to the south. And um, of course, I'm turning towards the north to go to uh, Changdao. And uh, I thought I would stop here in this town called Mei Malay. It's a very busy um, commercial town, kind of an uh, intersection town. And I stopped here for a cup of coffee at this kind of interesting uh, work workspace. They have a sign out front that says you can get coffee and use this as your workspace for 15 baht per hour kind of kind of place, you know. Students probably hang out here. Anyway, I just uh, got my uh, latte. Give you a, a look at it right there. Comes with crackers and some ice water. And here's the uh, inside of the uh, coffee shop. <laughs> it's a bit, bit of a mixed bag because 107 is an incredibly busy highway. It's right there. And uh, the windows are open. So there's a huge amount of traffic noise coming. I can, I can hardly even hear myself uh, speak. <laughs> and that much traffic noise would normally be a bad thing. But what it does is inside the coffee shop, it drowns out the music so I, I, I can record inside the coffee shop and, and I don't bother other people because, you know, I can't even hear me over the roar of the traffic so they, they can't hear me either. Yeah, lots of thoughts about that road. Um, I didn't stop anywhere other than for, you know, stopping to take a picture change a battery and a GoPro, a bathroom stop. You know, I didn't go to any restaurants or coffee shops or waterfalls. I didn't do anything. I just got on my scooter in Pai and rode to here. And uh, amazing road, beautiful, windy, like in the, in, up in the mountains, hairpin tight turns, really beautiful road to follow. Once you come down out of the mountains, it flattens out quite a bit, but you get these wide sweeping turns. But what you do get, uh, since I left so early this morning, was fog, thick fog. I, I couldn't see anything along the road at all. Um, made it really kind of interesting. I'd be riding along and then suddenly there's this one point where a herd of like, I don't know, 10, 15 carabao just kind of emerged out of the fog, moving slowly. They look massive in the fog, you know, when they kind of came out of the fog that way. And it reminded me of, uh, you know, Stephen King uh, short novella and the movie, you know, The Mist, which uh, I enjoy so much. I kept thinking about The Mist when I was out there and those carabao coming out of the fog were like the, you know, the monsters that live in the mist. And when you came up on these sharp turns, they really came as a surprise because you're just moving along in a straight line. And normally you see the arrows from a distance telling you that a curve is a sharp curve ahead. But in that thick fog, you couldn't see the arrows until you were right on top of them. Like when you, you're right at the curve, and then boom, you see the arrows, you know, you really had to be uh, careful. And uh, the rain last night made the road slippery. So I was riding pretty slowly, but also there was a real dense kind of forest jungle up there. And a lot of um, leaves, you know, thick, like thick carpets of leaves were on the highway in certain points and even carpets of pine needles, things like that. And those were, you know, slippery as ice. If you caught your wheel on those while going around a corner, yeah, your wheels would just slide right out from under you. So I was very careful to avoid those and, and keep, uh, keep riding slowly. Let's uh, give this latte a try. It looks good. 
smells good too. Mm, not bad. Half and half, I mean, good coffee flavor, strong coffee flavor, but it's, uh, it's not very hot. Yeah, it's not hot at all. If I had a microwave, you know, I'd probably toss it into a microwave <laughs> and just heat it up so I'd enjoy it more. Yeah, on this uh, highway, I passed a ton of quite interesting looking coffee shops. And um, that got me thinking a little bit. Um, two things. <laughs> uh, for one thing, I see all these coffee shops, but I'm kind of reluctant to stop because in all of Thailand, the cappuccinos and the lattes and the coffees are just never hot enough. So I'm always disappointed when I go into these coffee shops. So I'm kind of reluctant to do it now. Unless you want to get an iced coffee, those are always good. But it was so cold up there. Yeah, and speaking of the cold, to be honest, I feel a little bit like I've just gone 15 rounds with Muhammad Ali. I'm, I'm really beat up because it was so cold up there as I was riding. All my muscles tensed up, you know, just everything from my head down to my feet. So like all my muscles are sore because I just got so tense and I'm cramped everywhere. My neck is sore, my shoulders are sore, my fingers are sore, they're still frozen, everything. Plus all these dumb things keep happening. You know, you're, I'm wearing the mask and the mask is actually kind of cool when you're riding the scooter because, um, you know, you don't really need to wear a mask when you're out riding, but it works kind of like a uh, like a scarf that it keeps keeps my mouth warm so it's a kind of nice to wear but I'm busy adjusting the mask and I'm I was I was wearing uh, <laughs> I was wearing a glove this this glove on one hand and uh, because of the glove I didn't have a very good grip on the mask and I'm pulling it away and because it's got an elastic band it slipped out of my hand smacked me right in the eyeball it's just like smack i had my eye wide open so i've got like tears running down my face because i, I hit my eye so hard with the mask some kind of a, a big bee or a beetle or something came flying at me because i don't have a visor on my helmet the the bee or whatever it was smacked me right in this eye it was like being punched in the face it hit so hard so it's like I've been punched in this eye. I've been punched in this eye. I'm bruised from top to bottom, freezing cold. So yeah, that was a, a physically challenging uh, ride. But the other thing all those coffee shops made me think about is, I think I might change my plans. Don't hold me to this, but what I'm thinking about doing now I mean, is going back to Mesot the exact way I came here? So essentially, I'm thinking about doing the loop two times, like going a around the entire loop to go back to Mesot. And uh, it makes some sense because my original plan was just to go to Chiang Mai, and then you go south from Chiang Mai, and it's a shorter trip to go south from Chiang Mai, it's an easier trip to go back to Mesot. But it, that's not such an interesting route to follow. And this morning, I was thinking as I was riding along that my usual habit of leaving early in the morning isn't serving me that well on this trip because it's too cold in the morning, it's freezing cold, the fog and the mist is so thick. It's, it's beautiful. But you also don't, you don't get to uh, see anything. You don't get to see the scenery because it's all covered in a, a, a thick curtain of fog. And nothing is open yet. Uh, the coffee shops aren't open. And even if I wanted to stop, they were all closed. All the restaurants are closed. Everything is closed. And... 
to be honest, I was so cold, I couldn't really enjoy it as much as I, I wanted to because I was fighting the cold so much. So what I'm thinking about doing is instead of going through Chiang Mai back to Mesot, I'm going to go, when I leave here, I'm going to go from Chiang Dao back to Pai and then from Pai back to Mei Hong Song, from Mei Hong Song to Mei Sarang and there to uh, Mei So it will be a four day journey doing the entire loop, but doing it in four days, it, riding every single day. But what I'm going to do this time is leave mid morning if possible. So particularly for this trip to go from Chiang Dao back to Pai, it's not that far. You can do it in two or three hours if you're riding fast. So you don't need to leave early. And I think there are going to be some sunny days coming up soon. Like there's going to be a period of three or four sunny days for my ride back to Mesot. So what I think I'm going to do, oh, if I'm babbling, I, I can't think straight because of the traffic noise it's so loud. Um, I think what I'm going to do is make a really casual, uh, relaxing day to ride from Changdao to Pai. You know, just stay in the hotel, have a nice breakfast, relax, take my time, nice cup of coffee, and then leave from Changdao after the sun comes up. So just leave at like 10 o'clock in the morning instead of leaving at seven in the morning or six in the morning, you know, leave at 10, leave at 11. You could even leave at noon and you would still have plenty of time to ride to Pai. And then I can do that whole trip in the daytime when the sun is out, when it's nice and warm and really take my time and stop at one or two of the cafes along the way. And maybe, you know, do the same thing after, um, Pai to Mei Hong Son, leave, instead of trying to leave at the crack of dawn, you know, leave a little bit later, you know, leave at nine in the morning, leave at 10 in the morning, wait until the sun comes out and it warms up a little bit and sort of redo the entire loop. So trip number one around the loop will be the freezing cold misty loop. And now when I go back, it's going to be the warm, sunny, tropical loop. So that's what I'm thinking of doing. Yeah, I think I've already made up my mind. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So here it is, 11.30 in the morning, nice and warm, short sleeve shirt, sun is out, gorgeous weather. This is when you should leave your guest house. None of this leaving at uh, 6.30 in the morning. 11.30 is better. But man, I have to wonder, where are all these people going in their cars? This highway is incredibly busy. I thought it was going to be a small country road, but apparently there's uh, a lot of reasons for people to be going in this direction going from uh, Chiang Mai to uh, Chiang Dao. Does that mean Chiang Dao is a much larger town than I think it is? I thought it's a very small uh, place, but maybe it's a big city. Yeah, sitting in that coffee shop, I just about lost my mind from the noise of the passing traffic. At least now that I'm here in the traffic, I don't hear it quite as much. All I hear is the, uh, the sound of wind in my ears. Yeah, I really was not expecting to be on a big highway like this today. I just thought it would be small mountain roads the whole way to uh, Chiang Dao, but even 107 appears to be a major uh, system, transportation system here, going somewhere. Somewhere important, I don't know where. I believe uh, Changdao Mountain, I have to take down the mask because 
the wind is blowing it into my lips and I can't speak. The uh, Changdao Mountain, which is right beside Changdao, there's like, I think the Changdao National Park is there. I believe it's the third highest mountain in Thailand. Uh, I forget the height off the top of my head, but something like 2,000 uh, something something meters. I can't remember the height, but it's the third highest in the country. I'm pleased to report that 107 is no longer a four-lane divided highway. We're down to uh, two lanes heading through a, quite a scenic and narrow river valley, which is where I, where, that's where I want to be, that's for sure. But from time to time, there is still a lot of heavy traffic, even on this highway, so you end up singing the uh, hugging the shoulder song to yourself, you know? That could be, that could be my logo, hug the shoulder. Because I'm going so slow that everybody passes me and I have to stay as far over to the left as I can. And I'm always monitoring the traffic coming up behind me and the curves up ahead of me just so I can make sure that everybody has room to get past me. I got a giant truck coming up behind me. Got to hug the shoulder. <laughs> he was quite close. Quite often I'll try and time things. If I see something like that behind me, I'll find a spot on the road where I can really slow down. And I'll slow down and I'll pull over and I'll put on my signal light to the left to indicate that I'm slowing down, maybe turning, and then that it's safe for them to pass me. But there was no way to do that on that curve. But he was okay with it. <laughs> he passed me anyway. Getting close, I'm just five kilometers away from Changdao in my guest house. And directly ahead of me, that is the Changdao National Park and the Changdao Mountain Range. So the third highest mountain peak in Thailand is, is there somewhere behind all those clouds. Funny thing is when I was reading about Changdao, one of the reasons I made the final decision to come here instead of going to Chiang Mai is that I came across all these uh, travel articles online, not videos, but <laughs> actual articles with words that you had to read, you know, how archaic is that? And they would, in the headlines and in the articles, they would talk about Changdao, the hidden gem of Thailand, the place that nobody knows about, the place where nobody goes, unseen Thailand, all that kind of thing, you know, a hidden gem. <laughs> but. I'm here to tell you that if this is a hidden gem, um, I don't know why they have such a major highway leading to it. I'm sure it's a beautiful place and it's a great place to spend some time. It could even be called a gem, but a hidden gem, not so much. There's nothing hidden about this place. In fact, I've come across so many things about Thailand where even in YouTube videos, travel articles, they keep talking about how it's unknown, unseen, off the beaten path, it's hidden. There's nothing like that in Thailand as far as I can make out. Even among the Thai people themselves, tourism is a huge industry. And even without foreigners, there are tourists going all over the country, going everywhere, every chance they get. So, a lot of beautiful places to go, but none of them are hidden as far as I can tell. They're all very well known. I may not know about them, but other people, they definitely do.
but not to make too big a deal out of all that but when you think about the Mei Hong Son loop of course you think about places like Pai, Mei Hong Son, uh, Ban Rak Thai, the, the, the major towns along the loop and then when I read these articles they said um, that you, you really shouldn't miss Chang Dao that you should take the uh, the detour to come up here to see it because it is such a hidden gem so because of all that language I had it in my head that Chang Dao must be smaller quieter kind of more quaint than Pai or Mei Hong Son but it's absolutely not so far it's clearly a, a bigger city than any of those places. Thailand really can be a surprising and interesting place though. I was just thinking as I was riding into Changdao, what a crazy busy city it is. It feels like a metropolis. And I happened to spot a laundromat, which I desperately need. So I pulled over to look at the machines, make sure they were working, and it looks like a really nice laundromat. And right behind the laundromat, there's this. So I guess this is the edge of town. And uh, yeah, look at that scenery. Just beautiful, wild countryside. So this is what the, uh, the landscape is like around Changda Changdao. But, uh, 100 meters behind me, it's all grocery stores, banks, mechanic shops, scooter shops, gas stations, <laughs> strip malls, you know? Yeah, like right here. <laughs> this is right beside that scenic area. It's like a commercial center. I keep overshooting the road I need to get to my uh, guest house. It's over here somewhere. I've already gone past it once. Looking for a road. This might be it on my right. And yes, that is my road straight ahead. The name of the place, I keep forgetting, but I think the full name is Room for Rooms for Rent, Changdao, Chan and Seas, or Chan and Cheese. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce uh, the whole name. But man, just getting across one road here in Changdao is a... Uh, is a challenge. So much traffic. Every time you think the road is clear, somebody comes from around the corner. There we go. As I said, I think one of the owners is from the Netherlands. Uh, and that's probably where the name cheese or seas comes from spelled C-E-E-S. Chan is probably his wife, so Chan and C's. Uh, rooms for rent. This could be the place. Yeah, there it is there. Oh, so... <laughs> Just in case what I said made no sense at all. There you have it. Rooms for rent, Chan and C's or cheese. Look at that. Again, right in the middle of town. There's a 7-Eleven just steps away and a laundromat over there. But it looks like it has kind of a nice uh, rural setting. Look at all those trees. So, let's go... Uh, Check the place out.
I noticed when I sent my message over Facebook yesterday, the reply was in very clear and uh, simple and accurate English. So I, ha I got the impression I was chatting with a uh, foreigner. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the place. And they have, uh, yeah, looks like very simple kind of bungalows. There's some here hidden behind these trees because they have small fan only for 300 and then larger aircon units for 400 oh hello just scouting around a little bit Sorry? said i was just scouting around a little bit okay so you have a lot of cameras yeah i'm doing the gopro thing did you send me a message yesterday? That was me. Okay. That was me. Okay, just uh, show you. So happy here in my new home. Just as I, I showed up and I was riding my scooter around the property a little bit just to look at all the different uh, bungalows, what they look like. Uh, the owner, the ma owner, manager came out and it was the man that I was communicating with on uh, Facebook the other day to ask about this place. And he is the CEES of this operation, but I had the pronunciation completely wrong. It is pronounced CASE. I guess that's the Dutch pronunciation of those letters. That's just how it works. So this is Rooms for Rent Chan and Rooms for Rent Chang Dao Chan and Case. But anyway, his name is Case, he told me. And uh, yeah, he is a Dutch heritage. I mentioned that my cousin uh, had stayed here once upon a time, but of course he just sort of dismissed that as like, well, he, I'm not going to remember, you know, because a, lo a lot of people go through a place like this over the years, particularly pre-pandemic. So it's not like he's going to remember every visitor. But yeah, he was an extremely good host. It's, uh, yeah, language makes such a big difference. He speaks English perfectly. I can talk with him in English. And then we were chatting for a long time about uh, all kinds of things to do with Changdao. Thailand in general, you know, scooters, our, our lives here. And uh, he gave me, a, you know, some information about places to go. You know, here's a restaurant run by a Canadian. If you're interested, you know, go down this road so far, look for this sign, look for this place. And, uh, and he gave me a map. I'm always very excited about maps. You know, these, uh, I mean, it's a local tourism map, but, you know, it's a great little map. It has has... Uh, I think all the, uh, let's see if I can open it with one hand. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, the area, Changdao and the surrounding area, all the places you can go. And then, of course, some of the businesses on the side, you know. But uh, yeah, I, lo I love these. Helps me a lot in terms of uh, getting oriented. So he showed me the bungalows for 300 baht. And then those are the, no, 400. Those are the air-conditioned ones. And um, I asked to see one of those because they're large, not so much because of the air conditioning. I thought because they're larger, maybe it would be more comfortable over a three or four day period. And he showed me one of those, but then he also showed me one of the fan only rooms for 300 baht. And to me, it feels spacious. So, you know, I, I just went for this uh, 300 baht room. Why not? Um, but here it is. You've got uh, the front area, door, fan, TV, little table and chair. In the, the, the 400 baht room, it is quite a bit larger than this, and the table is much bigger and sturdier, I think, so it just has a different feeling to it. But um, as long as, yeah, I mean, to me, this is, this is like paradise right here. Kettle, you know, in a, in a room like this to have a kettle and some coffee available. And there's the bed, nice uh, double size uh, bed and a uh, nice window at the back to let in some light and some air, a wardrobe, and uh, yeah, your basic uh, bathroom. Hot water. Yeah, there you are. 
nothing uh, nothing could be uh, better. Let's uh, let's just step outside for just a minute to see uh, the world with some light <laughs> instead of being indoors. So yeah, here's the uh, uh, the property. And these are all of the uh, 300 baht smaller places. And uh, over here are the 400 baht. You can see, you know, just looking at them, they're uh, quite a bit larger. They would, uh, yeah, they would probably be uh, very nice to stay in. Yeah, but look at the uh, setting. In the city and yet uh, surrounded by trees and stuff. Trees and stuff. You can tell I'm a skill, I'm a, yeah, a botanist or something. Actually, yeah, look at that. There's a uh, stand of uh, bamboo. Very cool. I'm always uh, fascinated by the bamboo, the way it grows. Like every stalk, you know, grows so close together like that. It's almost like grass, you know. It's almost like a type of grass, the way it grows. So, you know, and their root system all bound together into one for a great big bundle like that. It's amazing. And I think that is it for today. At least as far as uh, this video, uh, small adventure is concerned. Yeah, that was an amazing ride. <laughs> it's so weird that it was just, you know, this morning I woke up and I was in Pi and I was in a world of fog, nothing but white fog everywhere around me, freezing cold. And now here I am with the, the sun out, nice and warm in an entirely new city. So that's pretty cool. And as I said, uh, I got the idea as I was riding that I'd like to see that road in particular again. I want to uh, ride along there. So I think I will retrace my steps to go back to uh, Mesod. Um, yeah, I'm going to do the entire loop a second time. <laughs> How exciting is that? <sighs> but yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's 400 kilometers, the direct route, or 600 going back through the entire loop. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Unless I change my mind. I can always change my mind. All right, I'm going to shut down. I have some errands to run, laundry to do, um, I'll, some other things to deal with. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.